notes here, starting with verse 12. I'm going to read verse 12 and 13 in Philippians chapter 2. He wants us to do something because of what Jesus did. And that is that he humbled himself, uh, even to death on the cross, uh, that we may have salvation in his name. Paul says, so then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now more so in my absence, work out. Your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Pray with me. Father, we thank you. We may be in your presence, first of all. That we know there was a great price that was paid through Jesus. He humbled himself, took on the form of a bond slave, and he served even to the point of death on the cross, it tells us here. Before we have read this passage. For that reason, Father, you exalted him above everyone. And for that reason, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Father, so we have a choice. To bow now, before our lifetime is over. Before we breathe our last breath. Or we will all at the judgment seat of God bow and say with no doubt that Jesus Christ is Lord. And all this to the glory of the Father. So Father, today as we open the word, would you guide us, lead us, help us? As we open our hearts to you, would you allow the word to be written on our heart that we may be convicted and convinced that our faith may grow and that we may grow as a, as a brotherhood as your church here at Severin, that, Father, we may make a difference as Paul here addresses the Philippian church. So this is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. And so uh, we're to work out our salvation because of what Jesus did. Humbled himself to the point of death. So in our baptism, we've humbled ourselves. Matter of fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 6, we died to self. So that we may glorify God, emptying ourselves and become servants to Him, to glorify Him. See, Jesus, Jesus finished the race, didn't He? He crossed the finish line. And that brought salvation to us. As a matter of fact, in John 19, 30, His very last words, as He would breathe His last breath, He said, it is finished. And so Paul says, work out your salvation. There's something for us to finish. And so part of that finishing is keeping the covenant that he gave us in his own blood to fulfill that covenant, be obedient to his every word, as he said in his last commission. Paul therefore said, work out. Work out your salvation. And so the first point we want to make this morning is, is work out our salvation, which involves both us and God, as we read there in verse 12. Now, if I were to ask everybody right now to get up and run in place, how long could you hold out before your legs start cramping and you get shortness of breath and we'd have to get uh, Dr. Romanowski out here to maybe give you some heart resuscitation? I don't think we could run very long, could we? And you, I do like interaction, but I'm not going to get you up to do that. First of all, I don't want to smell like a gym when we're finished, and I don't want to see anybody have a heart attack. But you see, we get this idea if we've got to work out if we're to get anything done. And Paul's trying to help us understand that this is a workout that we're involved in when it comes to our salvation. I remember uh, back in, in, in going into junior high school, back then you went into the seventh grade. Seventh, eighth, and ninth was junior high. And coming out of the sixth grade elementary school, I was like the fastest kid. And uh, I was a good long distance runner. I could outrun everybody and everything. But I was sort of worried a little bit because when you go into junior high school, other elementary schools come pouring into your junior high. So it's more people. And I thought, you know, I'm going to lose my position. Fastest guy around. And so there was a guy by the name of Wayne Reamer. And uh, Wayne was known because his parents had a fallout shelter in their backyard. And uh, I got to see it. So this is pretty wild, you know, fallout shelter. But anyway, Wayne Reamer... In the first day of uh, gym class, and we always did the cross-country thing to get, to get ready, he would always take off like a shot and just leave all of us. And I'm like, 
How discouraging when the first day of school, here's some guy just beating everybody. And so I really took it to heart, and I started working out and running, and, and I wanted to make sure I could catch this guy. And uh, I had to make up my mind. I had to work it out in my own mind, the strategy that was going to beat this guy. Because it was bugging me. And so finally, a big cross-country day comes in. It's the real run. It's not just exercise. It's time to go. And uh, we took off, and I just went faster than he did to get out in front of everybody. I just ran as fast as I possibly could, got a good measure away from him like he always did to us back in the pack, and I was able to finish that race and beat him. I beat him. And uh, it was worth it. When Paul uses the workout here, when he says workout, is to carry out to completion what was begun. And that's what he's talking about according to our, our salvation here. Work it out. There's something to complete. There's something that we, that we have, there's a place we have to end up, and that's called the end of our salvation, the end of our life. We have to keep a covenant, we have to finish the course the way that the Lord did. Paul put it this way in 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 7. Listen carefully to what he says. He says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. We know that Paul's in prison as he writes these letters. As he writes these letters. So his, his departure is close. But here's what he says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is lied up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward me on that day. And not only me, but also all who have loved his appearing. Do you love Jesus' appearing? Are you glad that he came? <laughs> but Paul says now there's a faith to keep. There's a course to run. And so, um, you know, we kind of get this idea of working out. We know what it is, don't we, to, to a certain degree. And uh, there's the old saying, you know, no pain, no gain, right? And so uh, months ago when I started down there with, with Chuck and, and John and uh, Chuck is still doing a really good job out of it. John and I have dropped off, but we need to get back over there. But, uh, you know, no pain, no gain. Well, we went over to the Rascal Center, which is better known as the Pascal Center. And, uh, and we started working out with the seniors. But the difference is you start with pain. You know what I mean? You start with pain. But look, if you don't stretch muscles, they don't grow, do they? You know, if you don't get your heart rate up, because when I first went there, I said, well, am I really getting my heart rate up? You know, I'm doing one of those bikes where you go just like back and forth, and you sit on the seat. Very comfortable. You know, I was very comfortable. But, you know, did I really get my heart rate up? And so you know when you do is you start sweating a little bit. You know, your heart's racing and everything. You kind of wonder, is it going to come out of your chest? You know, you have to get it up in order for it to actually help. And so a workout, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You got to work out. You got to, you have to do something. You have to build up. And so uh, the day that I beat old Wayne, and by the way, is Greg here? Imagine Greg with long hair. That's what he looked like. But, but we all had long hair then, you know, but long hair with receding hair. And, uh, but he had, a, he had a bandana on his head, and he ran. Uh, we were the hippies in the group. Uh, but, but in that race, I was halfway through. And, man, I got one of those stitches. You know what I'm talking about? Somewhere in your gut. I mean, it starts hurting. You're like, no, I want, you want to quit right there. I mean, you want to stop the pain, it's just excruciating. And I don't know why, it just came out from somewhere. I just started singing, one wheel on my wagon, and I'm still rolling along. The Cherokees are after me, they look bad, they look mad, but I'm singing a happy song. All right, you got to give me a hand for that one. Not too many people are brave enough to do that. But I know Nita remembers that song. If anybody remembers, it's her. But those crazy things just happen to you, don't you? Don't they? And so, but it helped me through that moment, and I made it, and I beat him. And it was worth the pain. You see, our bodies, we resist uh, exercise, don't we? Our body is weak. We don't want to get up. We don't want to work out. We don't want to hit our feet on the ground. Now, I know some people have three alarm clocks. And I know most people have snooze, right? And uh, I got this special one, a little, little clock that has a little button on it, you know. And zzz, you hit the button, you know, it turns it off. Five minutes later, it starts up again, you know. See, we have ways to stay in bed, don't we? But see, our, our bodies, they don't want to get up. But when we do get up, when we make up our mind to work out, doesn't it feel good afterwards? So we know we're doing the right thing. Now, Paul puts it this way. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 
chapter 9, listen to what he says here about this familiar passage. But Paul's saying, look, if you're going to run, do it to win. If you're going to get up, get up to win. If you're going to become a Christian, do it to win. Run all the way. And notice what he says here. Do you not know that those who run in the race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games, exercise self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable wreath. Therefore, I run in such a way to not, without aim, I, I box in such a way, uh, not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I may not be disqualified. So Paul says, run the wind. Now, um, is Justin Swafford here? See, anybody see him? Stand up. He's in the back. Okay, um, Justin, he was, he was tired of his weight. He didn't like it. And so now he's buff. If you see him, I mean, he is probably the buffest guy maybe next to Toby in the place. I mean, he, he's buff. And, uh, and uh, he, he decided that he didn't, he didn't like it anymore. He was going to do something about it. And I discovered something about him. He has a go get it, finish the prize, finish the race when you start it. And you don't be, it's hard enough to lose weight, isn't it? But then become buff, that's something else, isn't it? That's a lot of strain and pain and workout. And now he helps other people do it, doesn't he? And he's good at it. He's encouraging. He knows, he knows how to do it. But there's something else that I know about him. Uh, he volunteers to mow like some of you guys around here. But this guy doesn't stop until it's cut. I'm talking about the whole 14 acres of grass is cut. You see, he wants to finish. He has the drive to do it. You see, we agreed to live for Jesus when we died with him in baptism. We agreed to wash, as he washed away our sins, we agreed not to be sinners anymore. He rose us to walk in newness of life. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He's equipped us to walk the walk, to finish the race, to finish the win. Now, I've been talking about physical workouts, but what about the spiritual side? We're in a spiritual warfare. You see, the devil doesn't want you to possess what he once had. And so you have him as your adversary besides our flesh, which is weak, which doesn't want to get up in the morning and get things started. You see, he doesn't want us to have the peace that he had with God at one time. He doesn't want to know that peace. That's the ultimate peace for any human beings to be right with God and their Savior. So our flesh, it really wants the comforts of this world, doesn't it? We really like the first rewards that the world presents. We see we're blinded by it, though. That's why he says in verse 15, be saved from this crooked and perverse generation. And so we have to work at our salvation in order to win the battle. So I remember back in, in Bible college, my first year, my freshman year of college really wasn't good. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, as the semester ended, I, I had some kind of cold and um, it was a chest infection, whatever it was. And the antibiotics that the doctor prescribed gave me clinical hepatitis on top of being sick. It was miserable. And uh, you have a 15-day window to come back into the second semester. I was two or three weeks late, so four to five weeks. I'm telling you, it was just a spiritual warfare going on. I thought I was heading in the right direction. I was, doubt came into my mind. How am I going to do this? I was already academically way behind when I, when I went into Bible college. I said, man, this is, this is going to be tough. And then I come back, and there's dissension in, in our dorm, in the men's dorm. So, whoa. And um, as I think back, not many kids who started finished and actually graduated. And now there's a spiritual warfare. The devil doesn't want young people to get into the ministry. He made that very clear. And so in the, so in the dorm, we had some guys came just to play. And so one night, uh, they took some, they were crushing cans with a bat, two o'clock in the morning. And um, our, our dorm room, it was almost like an eighth inch of sheetrock on the walls. And the building actually was not made out of two before. It was made out of metal studs. And just everything echoed through the door. You had to have respect each other. Two o'clock in the morning, popping bottle uh, 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 um, cans. And also, they were taking caps. You know, the line of caps. You put a little gun, and they were smacking them with the baton, and they were blasting off. I'm like, man, I didn't come here for this. Now, I just want to tell you, I wasn't that far from the world yet, so I went there and grabbed the kid by the ear and took him down to the dean and said, you know, we can't sleep at night. I said, I don't know how you can sleep in this noise. We can't. 
It's just everything was, wasn't right. It was spiritual warfare. And so here's what I committed to my mind. I said, God, you got to help me here. I feel like throwing in the towel and I give this thing up. And so I memorized Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. And I'll tell you that, those two verses got me through. Those two verses helped me through that spiritual warfare and made it through that freshman year. And on to the next one. So we have a spiritual warfare. We have to work out our salvation, the Paul says here. And notice, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In Acts 4, 2, 4, with Peter preaches, preaches on the day of Pentecost, he said, be saved. Save yourself is the idea from this crooked and perverse generation. Say, be saved. That means you have to take a step and do it. It's something you're going to need. It's something that God knows you do not want to know the judgment, the severe judgment that's coming across to humanity because of what he preserved for us in Christ. He does not want us to go to judgment. He doesn't take pride in judgment. He doesn't want to uh, judge the wicked, but he has to. And so our ultimate salvation is eternal peace with God. But in the meantime, he wants to rescue us from this current problem, this current crooked world. So in Christ, we're kind of away from the, uh, the darkness, aren't we? We're protected from the darkness. We've chose to come out of darkness, so we're not pulled in, into it. People live in it every single day, miserable lives. And uh, I think back to Acts 16, where Paul's in jail, earthquake takes place. The jailer draws his sword. He's going to commit suicide right there. Paul stops him and saves him from taking his life right there. And then that same night, they go back and they save the whole household. The whole, whole, whole household is baptized. So God wants to rescue us now and rescue us later. Jesus said this, Don't fear those who kill the body. Rather, fear him who can destroy soul and body in hell. See, God is just to punish sin. It's messing everything up. It's taking away our joy and our peace. It destroys everything. And he is holy and he wants to get rid of it. You see, every human soul lives in fear of death. And the reason why they do, if you go back to Ecclesiastes, God, in chapter 3, verse 11, he put eternity in the hearts of human beings. We recognize that we're supposed to live on. We don't want to die. We don't want to get old, <laughs> right? We don't want to face that place that we're unsure of unless we're in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a, a, a reality show just came on been a couple weeks now, and uh, it's, it's uh, William Shatner, James D. Kirk from Starship Enterprise for you Chuckies, and uh, Terry Bradshaw, Henry Winkler, and George Foreman. But what a group. And they go out, and they're going to go see the world. And um, so, of course, you know, they're hilarious, they're funny, they're doing all these crazy things, but they sit down at the table, and uh, it's the end of the night, and uh, the whole day's over, uh, and they really get serious about something, and they say, you know, what's your greatest fear? And... Um, Captain Kirk, William Shatner, and you could see it in his eyes. He was honest. He, he was fearing death. He's 85 years old. He's real close. And so he's fearing death. And so, you know, uh, I, I guess the starship really wasn't there, was it? You know, running all over the universe wasn't there. And uh, all the adventures did not take away the fear that he had. And so Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He places a high value on our salvation. It's something to fear over, shake over, and get serious about. Salvation means to rescue from death. You know, um, matter of fact, the same William Shatner, remember he did this, this show 9-11? Rescue 9-1-1, that's what it was. Rescue 9-1-1, not 9-11, but Rescue 9-1-1, remember that? And... Um, most people that have a, have a, a near-death experience change dramatically, don't they? Boy, they see life in a whole different way. You see, fear motivates, doesn't it? And that's exactly what it does when you have one of those situations. Now, there's a right place for fear when it comes to the Christian life. Listen to these Proverbs as I go through them. Proverbs 1.7 says this, 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Because you humble yourself and recognize, I don't have it all together. And I don't have all the answers. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 8.13 says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And see, today in our country, we're embracing evil. Look at all the shows that embrace the, uh, the evil person. Or the, or the um, how many um, of the um, oh, okay, mafia shows are out there. We glorify it. We're supposed to hate evil and what it does. And the fear of the Lord begins that in your own heart. It says in 1027, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. Because you have a little more wisdom now. Because you're doing it God's way and not your way. And you don't run into danger. It prolongs your life. Matter of fact, the fifth commandment is with a promise. Honor your mother and father, you'll live long in the land. That's wise living. If we fear God, we begin to do that. 14, 26, and 27 says, The fear of the Lord is strong confidence in a fountain of life. Doesn't it sound good? A fountain of life. You know, if kids are not valued the way they're supposed to be by their parents, they have no confidence. And that's why the world mows them down. Gets them on drugs. Gets them a part of a gang. They have no confidence. But the fear of the Lord brings confidence to kids. They know who they are. And they're not pulled in and persuaded by the evil one and his people. 16b says this, the fear of the Lord keeps one away from evil. Because you travel with the right people. 1923 says this, the fear of the Lord leads to life. So that no, so the one may sleep satisfied untouched by evil. Now I really like this one. We got to sleep every night, right? But I know there's plenty of people who fight sleep. They like to stay up all night. And then the next day you're wondering why they're nodding in church. But I'm not talking about the church, right? But anyway, I like to sleep in safety, don't you? Don't you like to lay down peaceful, satisfied, and go to sleep? Yeah. Now, can somebody break in your house? Could a plane, you know, living around here, could a plane crash into your house? I mean, there's a myriad of things that could take away your peace at night. But the fear of the Lord brings satisf- satisfactory and safety, okay? Um, I'm on one of them CPAP machines. I've probably told you that enough. But anyway, they really work. And you can ask your wife if they work because you're not snoring anymore. But, uh, but one thing is you go right into REM sleep, completely into REM sleep. That means you hear nothing. I mean nothing. The night they came to get Esther, ambulance, the fire engines are there banging on the door and everything, I'm sleeping. And I told you, if anybody comes in, you're going to have to save us because I can't. All right. <laughs> By the time I wake up, you know, the, the gun's probably right at my head. But it says right here, the fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied and untouched by evil. And not many of us are touched by evil in our homes. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are rich, riches, honor, and life. So a little bit of fear won't hurt you. So Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So, our, so we're not totally passive in our salvation. There's something we have to do. We have to finish the course. We've got to keep running to win. And uh, we have to obey the commandments of Jesus. And secondly, God is at work in us. Notice what it says there. For our good pleasure. Notice that. When I saw that, I'm thinking, this is amazing. For it is God who is at work in you. Work out your salvation, fear and trembling, because God is at work in you both to will and to work his good pleasure. And I just like this idea. In other words, he's saying, look, work out your salvation, for it is God who's working in you. It's not your psychiatrist, and they're good. It's not your counselor. It's not your best friend. Uh, It's not your teacher. It's not, don't follow a man to heaven. Follow Jesus to heaven. It's easy for us to do that, to get caught up in another personality. (coughs) Pardon me. But we want to follow the Lord to heaven. And it says here, God's working in you. Now think about that for a moment. See, if our faith tells us that God's the origin of life, and it's especially difficult for us to grab onto it in an age where everybody's saying, we evolved, we evolved, we evolved, all this happened through an explosion. We're trying to explain away God, and our kids are hearing it, we're hearing it all the time, and we're old, we're antiquated, the Bible doesn't make any sense to them. 
we trust that God in the beginning did give us origin. And we look out to the vastness of space and we're like, it's so big. And then we're so complex. We're like, this God must be enormous in power and greatness. But yet it says here, he is at work in us. That's a personal God, isn't it? Personal. So he's more than almighty, he's personal. Not the gods we make up in our mind. They're not personal like the God of the Bible. So the one who can calm the storm, the one who can heal any part of our body in any moment, is the same one who's at work in us to complete our salvation. Should we make it or what? Should we be able to make it to the finish line? How could we not? When I was in second grade, uh, they figured out something I already knew. I couldn't read very well. And so they sent me to the vice principal, Miss Hentz. I'll never forget Miss Hentz. She had silver hair and she had a silver chain that held her glasses to her face. And, and, and when she wasn't using them, they would be on her silver chain. And uh, she was so gracious to me. And uh, she came up with this little thing where there's a list of words. And she took two three by five cards and she would go like that and show the word and I'd had to say it. And uh, I, I was really, I, I, didn't, I wanted to do well. I didn't want her to know what was wrong with me. I, I was ashamed that I couldn't read very well. But she was so gracious and really did all she could to help me. You see, God knows our every weakness and pain, doesn't he? He knows what we're made of. He knows where we've come from. He knows our background. He knows who's hurt us. He knows when our, our life is loveless. But he is gracious to help us. Listen to these words by King David. He, you know, I, when I look back at the Old Testament, I say, I'm glad we didn't have to be at war with swords and spears. It's a bloody mess. And I know the Civil War is in all wars. It's a bloody mess. And man, you have to be brave to be able to cut another person and stand in that way. And he was being pursued by the Philistines all the time. And uh, it, it was ugly. Even though he was a man who could kill 10,000 and Saul killed his thousands, war is ugly. But here's what he said in the Psalm 58, 8, 50, 56, 8. You have taken account of my wanderings. He knew where David was, where in the cave or in the battlefield, wherever he was, wherever he was being pursued, God knew. He trusted in that. But then he goes on to say these words. Put my tears in your bottle. That's just remarkable, isn't it? You see what David's saying there? I know, God, you. You don't miss a tear. You don't miss a prayer. As a matter of fact, you save up my tears. Whether it's gladness, happiness, stress. Now, if you imagine David being the king, that God's anointed, he had to go tell these families, your son is dead. He had to help bury these families. How many tears did he cry? Even though he was wrong in adultery, he cried for seven days over that child that it may live. And he said that God catches tears in a bottle. See, David knew that God didn't miss anything. The idea that God would collect our tears shows just how involved he is. He wills and to work in our salvation with us. He wants to see us make it. Now, um, what's the... What's the phrase you most hear when you go to Chick-fil-A, all you Chick-fil-A folks here? My pleasure. Now, how many employees do we have here for Chick-fil-A now? Raise your hand. Look at them all. Even Greg raised his hand. And now, how many people have gone to Chick-fil-A? Yeah. Yeah, how, how's their service? Why does it make a difference to say my pleasure? Did you raise your hand? Oh, you put your arm around your husband. That's fine. I almost called on you. But you, you imagine saying that all day long? Either you're going to hate that place and quit, or you're going to start having a good attitude. My pleasure. My pleasure. My pleasure. Matter of fact, to say it, you better have a smile on your face. You really can't say it any other way, can you? My pleasure. My pleasure, you got a smile. And so besides a good attitude, boy, they have good service, don't they? And that's how we go there. 
You know, I don't need my dentist to say, he's getting ready to grind on my teeth, my pleasure. <laughs> it's my pleasure today to work on your teeth. And, uh, but if he's got a good attitude and good sense of humor, and I know he cares for me, he can say, this is my pleasure if he wants. It's all in the attitude, isn't it? You see, in Hebrews 9, we're reminded that God disciplines those who he loves. But you see, he don't take pleasure in that. But he takes pleasure in the results of that discipline when he sees us change. No different as we do as parents. You see, it's God's good pleasure. He wants us to comply because he sees the fruit of our life. He sees the change. And so he wants us to get up. He wants us to work out. But he wants, it, he wants us to do it relationally. He wants us to get up and the first thing we think about is thanking him. Because we have a lot of reasons too, don't we? You could go through a list every morning of just thanksgiving we owe to God for our family, for our church, for our life, for our health. For the fact that even if our health eludes us, that we have heaven waiting for us. And so every day, he's looking for that. So when we're willing to work out our salvation, it is God's pleasure to work with us. You see, he wants to complete us. That word there, talias, it means to mature us. And uh, he, you know, he wants to grow our faith. And he's patient, long-suffering to do it, isn't he? Yeah, he wants to heal hearts from loss and broken late relationships. We all face it, don't we? We all face loss of relationship, whether it be separation, divorce, or job, or career, and all this. We're separating all the time, aren't we? But God is saying that I want to help you through that time. When your heart is broken, when you're estranged, God wants to fill in those blanks. He don't was, doesn't want us to lose and shipwreck our faith over these disappointments of life. He also wants to reform generational defects. He doesn't want us to pass any defects on. So he's there to work on those defects. Now here's how he does it. He won't do it until you realize you have one. <laughs> and most of the time when you get married, that's when you figure out you have them. Because before you weren't paying attention to them. But now somebody else is. But it's not until we listen and take inventory of ourselves and realize that we have them that God goes to work. You'll start listening, say, oh, man, I'll just start reading books. You'll maybe go to it, seek out a counselor. Good idea. The Bible even says you're wise if you go seek out a counselor because you'll have many victories in your life. And so that's what God wants to do, that very thing. He wants to revive our marriages so our kids grow up complete. It's God's good pleasure to do this. Now, I've got two minutes and 21 seconds left, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to, last, we're going to look at the very last section here. You see, God has a purpose for us working out our salvation. And here's what it is. It says, to appear as lights in a crooked and perverse generation. Notice what it says here. Do all things. Why do you have to say that? Do all things, everything. Actually, that's minus two minutes, isn't it? Sorry about that. Ben, come on up. I I've read that wrong. Come on up. Sorry about that. But he says, do all things without grumbling and complaining. So did I hear some grumbling out there already? Do all things without grumbling and complaining. And you're going to get home long before it's lunchtime. It's only 20 after 11. But it says here, do all things without grumbling and disputing so that you may prove yourselves blameless and innocent children above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. And so here's the point. When we work it out, when we try every day to complete our salvation, God uses that as a bright light in a crooked and dark time. You see, most of our witnessing is our life and not our doctrine. That comes after they see your life. And he says to the church, don't be grumblers. Grumbling always leads to disputes. And you come into a church where there's a bunch of grumbling, that means there's disputes, people pick it up right away. They will not see the light of Jesus until we act right. That's another good reason or the final good reason to work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it also is about somebody else's salvation. Paul said, watch your life and doctrine closely that you may save yourself and your hearers. And it starts with our attitude here. So God has a purpose to save us, but also to be a reflection of Jesus that brings others to him. Now, the last thing I put on here is don't be a crooked Hillary. I think someday that may become a saying for our children. Don't be a crooked Hillary. 
And don't be that because it's a noose around her neck. Once you get that reputation. So he said, be saved from a crooked and perverse generation. That's what these scriptures are encouraging us to do. So God wants us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. He wants us to finish the race. And I'm walking off the stage. Men, go. He wants us to finish the race. As we come to a time of communion, listen to what Paul says in verse 17. But even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, Paul says, upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. And when Paul talks about being poured out as an offering, as a drink offering, he is talking about his death. He's talking about the end possibly coming for him. We knew he was in prison and that could come. But the one focus he had was this. You complete my joy. It's not in vain, this race that we've been running. And it's not in vain what I've poured into you and what you've poured back into your salvation. And it brings joy at the end of the game. So it's okay if he's poured out like a drink offering. You see, if you go back to numbers, that drink offering was something that was uh, for a leader. Before he drank a sip of his wine, he poured it out to his God. But in the Bible, that pouring out of that offering was on the altar before the sacrifice was given to God by you personally to the priest. But also it was even poured right on the offering itself. But Jesus poured out his own blood that we may have life and forgiveness of our sins. And so when we come to the communion time, we see how precious his life was. We also see the cost that he had to pay that we may have salvation, which, by the way, is a gift. So when we come to this time of the service is to remember. Remember because we forget. Remember because we do go astray. We stop working out. And so communion always reminds us, get back on the program. Get up tomorrow. Get yourself ready. Get fit. Get spiritually fit again. Let's pray. Father, thank you. But in this communion time, we remember a price was paid. Jesus gave his body, which was represented by this blood. He gave his life. It says that not a bone was breaking on his body. And he was already dead when he hung on the cross. But it says that water and blood gushed out when he speared him in the chest. Father, we know his heart was broken. The water mixed with the blood. And so we're thankful that in his body he did not sin. He became the perfect sin offering for all sinners. And Father, we're reminded of the cup. We give thanks for it because it's Jesus' blood. It represents the spilling out of his blood, pouring out, and offering that we may have remissions of our sins. So I pray, Father, your blessing upon this community. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name.